Hi, I'm Tom Ackerman. Hi, I'm Colette Burson. Hi, I'm John Lee Hancock. Hey, I'm Jeff Wadlow. And you are watching Movers and Shakers. Movers and Shakers. Movers and Shakers. Movers and Shakers. It's unlimited. this afternoon and the energy of the festival, uh, the geniality of the town. I've been here several times before yeah. and I love Charlottesville. Okay, all right. Now, with this being um, uh, Veterans Day weekend, you know, what is it like for you to, to be back here to, to uh, talk about Beetlejuice, especially considering, you know, your career trajectory of, of me understanding that you were in the Air Force before, you know, really pursuing um, your career as a DP? Well, the Air Force experience really is what got things going. Yeah. Uh, I was very lucky. I was uh, assigned as a motion picture production officer, which meant that essentially I got to spend my whole period of time uh, making movies. Now, they were pretty dreadful movies, like training films for sentry dog, veterinary care, you know, okay. that type of thing, okay. uh, chemical warfare, uh, electronic countermeasures, you know, not, not really box office affair, but um, it, was, it was a very valuable uh, time. And so, but honestly, when, when we have Veterans Day, what I think about is how lucky I was. I was very lucky, came back in one piece, and it makes me mindful of all those who didn't. Sure, sure. Um, now, with that being said, I was just talking about Beetlejuice. You know, it's such a cult, uh, a, a cult favorite. You know, among so many folks. Uh, what is it? Have, have you had, you know, the current generation of uh, moviegoers, um, you know, discuss you know any aspect of that film to you? And what is it like to you know have perhaps previous generations say, you know, oh, I watched it, you know, when I was growing up and, you know, I've introduced it to my kids and, and you know, we love that film. What is it like to, you know, have it transgress, you know, over generation to generation like that? Well, I'll tell you one thing, it feels great. It, it feels wonderful when you have been able to work on a film that does find an audience, in this case, one that lasts for decades and decades. Yeah. And yet, when I got the script for Beetlejuice, back in, you know, almost 30 years ago, right? Sure. Um, I had done one film with a short film called Frankenweenie, live action yeah. version mm -hmm. of Frankenweenie with mm -hmm. Tim Burton. Great experience. Tim and I knew one another fairly well. I get the script, and on the page, mind you, this is before Michael Keaton was cast. Yeah. I'm reading this thing called Beetlejuice, and it was weird, okay? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was out there. Sure. Um, at the very same time, I was up for, and they wanted to hire me for, a very traditional mainline backlot studio comedy. Yeah. Really nice budget, you know. I could drive to work. <clears throat> but that, that was what was on the t on the the platter at that time. Frankly, it was a it was a a mind it it, it was a uh, a decision that was easily made. Um, yeah, because I. I, I believed in what Tim was going to do with this film. Okay. I believed and, and believe that he is one of those directors with a vision. People talk about vision, vision sure. all the time. <laughs> right. Talking about it and having it are two different things. And his, as his entire filmography, I think, suggests, Tim Burton is an artist. He is able to go beyond the script page, frankly, and create a world. Okay. So in Beetlejuice, my job and my joy was to join him in creating that world. Okay. 
All right, great. Now, with in the landscape of filmmaking that we're you know living in now, you know you have so many films that are from you know a couple of decades ago, whether it's the '80s and '90s or even further, that are you know coming back. You know, Blade Runner being a good example. And I understand that uh, Beetlejuice has been in development, you know, hill so to speak of of you know coming back with you know potentially another film. So, I. I, you know, there have been news about uh, some of the original folks coming back, whether it's Keaton or Burden. So if those that original team comes back, you know, would you be willing to, you know, to, to take part in it? Oh, I'd be very willing to take part in it. I have to say that those conversations have been very ongoing. prolonged. Yeah. They have been ongoing for two or three years yeah. or more. Yeah. Uh, but if it were to happen and if I were invited back, I would certainly like to do it. It was a joy shooting for Tim in every way. Okay, all right. And, and lastly, you know, speaking on that idea of the current landscape of, of filmmaking, for someone who wants to, you know, get into that field of uh, photography as a, as a DP, with the resources that are available, you know, you have YouTube, people have their phone now that basically can do movies these days. Uh, what what's, what would be your advice, you know, to them with, you know, all the, the resources that are available? Well, obviously the resources available now are far, far in excess of what I had as a sure. college student. Sure. And frankly, there's been a transformation of the way we create images for motion pictures. Yeah. <clears throat> Has it changed the need for story and content, brilliant acting? Yeah. No, that, that is a kind of a constant. And, and audiences are quick to detect something that's fake, <clears throat> that has been cavalierly offered up yeah, for them. Yeah, they're more sophisticated, sure. You know, they're, 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 the threshold is very, and, and the bar is very high yeah. for content and quality and vision. That, that being said, cameras are now uh, digital. I mean, I, I've shot upwards of 35 movies on film feature films and not including all the other stuff I've done, music videos and commercials and everything, but <clears throat> you know, quite a few decades of work on film. And now for the last 10 years I've been doing mainly digital cinematography. <clears throat> As an artist, I'm perfectly happy, I'm thrilled to have a medium, <clears throat> first of all, that is so resonant in terms of its, uh, the palette that it, that it gives us, the quality, the post-production flexibility, I remember when I was in seventh grade and I developed, developed my own first role of film and it was intoxicating. I mean, uh, the, the experience of seeing pictures come out of nothing, essentially, yeah. with a couple of trays of, or a can of chemicals in your, in your bathroom with the towel stuffed under the door so light wouldn't enter. Right. Um, but that being said, I think those that lament the passage of film as a photographic medium in, in content that is. I'm not talking about uh, still photography. It's still got a very vibrant role to play there, especially in fine arts, mm -hmm. upscale photography. But as far as movie making, it's essentially gone. Yes, we're going to bring 70 millimeter back from time to time for, <laughs> for uh, roadshow, yeah. big engagements. But let me just see, how, how does that equate for a student, a cinematography student or a directing student in college um, will that equate to them ever being able to touch a roll of 70 millimeter film? Right. Unlikely. Unlikely. Okay. All right. All right. Well, Thomas, thank you so much. I appreciate your time. There you have it, guys. I'm here at 2017 Virginia Film Festival. I'm Brandon Choi. This is Thomas Ackerman. I'll see you soon.